maybe four questions that we could ask in this is how much, like who would be compensated, when, and the big one is why. Like who's gonna pay the money, you know? Like why should they pay? And those are some of the questions that we need to like ask ourselves. The discussion of reparation has to be broadened beyond just African Americans or for blacks in America. The, the discussion of reparation has to include Africa, the Caribbean, it has to include all where we find black in the diaspora and of course blacks from the motherland. Because if you really want to talk suffering as a result of slavery, you know, we cannot focus on ourselves over here in the West and think that we really got it. But the continent of Africa has still is nowhere near recovered from slavery and then post-slavery colonization. It has listened to the news just this past week. The life expectancy rate in Mozambique is 38 years. 10 years ago it was 55. It's down to 38. A lot of that is a result of AIDS, AIDS HIV and AIDS. And you might wonder where the connection is. Um, well, you know, if we think seriously about what colonization has done, how we have set up despots and dictators in a lot of these lands that have kept their people basically in chains and enslaved over time. Um, we're in South Africa, for example, they're still opposed to the, the, some of the concoction that they're using to treat HIV and AIDS because the government doesn't believe. Um, so I, I'm just saying people in the West, in America particularly, aren't the only ones that have suffered as a result of slavery. So when we think of reparation, we have to think beyond the shores. I put it this way, we have to think about reparations at home and abroad. Home being Africa and abroad being the diaspora, wherever you might find black people or their descendants. Any conversation, I would say, about, um, about reparations uh, must consider that. So let's look at some of the people who oppose um, reparations. And we'll start with maybe one of the most popular guys in the black community. <laughs> Bill Clinton, former president. Popular African American president. Yeah, right. You know, I don't I, I put that in my text, but I say, well, you know, I don't want to be, I don't want to be, um, be deemed as being racist or insensitive. But that said that about Bill Clinton, you know, that he's the first black president. Well, you know, um, Bill Clinton opposes um, reparations, and let me tell you what, what Bill Clinton had to say about uh, uh, he does not favor compensating the victims of slavery because the nation is so many generations removed from that era that reparations for black Americans may not be possible. Um, and he went on to say, rather than reparations, the nation needs to continue to work to erase the effects of past discrimination. He called for a new national dialogue on race, saying the nation should strive to become, uh, I quote, truly multiracial democracy. Um, you know, I guess it will become a truly multiracial. No, he says, I guess if we become a truly multiracial society, there will be no need for reparations. So, you know, back to one of the questions is when? When will we become a truly multiracial society? Yes. Yeah, he did. While he had the opportunity to do something, the power to do something. I guess my question would be though, do we really need hypocrites? Like kind of champion in this cause. You know, considering how difficult it is already. You need some credibility. You know, one of the things I said, you have to be convincing if you're gonna make this point. And if you're a hypocrite, which I find these guys to be, you know, I'm, I'll confess, I'm one of those that I do not hold Bill Clinton in high regards. I like his presidency, I like the fact that he did much more than any Republican would have done. But he squandered so many opportunities, including one to speak out for reparations. Even if he said, you know, the Congress would have to decide, because we know the Congress have to decide where money is concerned. I mean, you can stand for something. You know, I mean, you really can't say However, and I'm quoting now, reparation for all African Americans run the risk of compensating the descendants of black slave owners. Black slave owners, while not numerous, are nevertheless a prominent and poignant part of slavery's legacy. He, he also says, and I'm sure this is news to you too, by the way, that black 
slave owners is a prominent part of slavery's legacy here in America. He said because African American owned slaves would not want to risk the um, to risk paying the descendants of those people. He further said, and African Americans who emigrated to the United States after slavery were, was abolished were in many instances, hear this, the descendants of African slave traders. So he says, would it make sense then, indeed would it be just to seek reparation for African Americans whose ancestors were complicit in the crime of slavery? So here we have a man then who, whose defense is that African American owned slaves and that other emigres after the abolition of slavery were possible slave traders that made the progress possible. Reparation like affirmative action, quota and racial set aside will exacerbate racial issues and detract from a genuine understanding of equal opportunity. And he said the rule of law and the principle of equality demands a colorblind society where equal opportunity is the principle of distributive justice. The greatest reparation for African Americans is to continue and to redouble our commitment to this principle of justice. Let me just say this and we can invite some comment like after. You know, the principle he's talking about here is colorblindness. Let me just say this. I've been waiting 300 years for colorblindness. Um, it was just last week that I read in the Sacramento Bee that African Americans account for about 15% of the population, but 35% of the stops are the rule by police officers. And by the way, the person who was doing the study was saying, and we don't think any racial profile is going on here. <laughs> <laughs> I want you guys to think about this, do we know? A lot of African Americans living in Sacramento are poor and can't afford cars. So even though they account for 15% of the population, they don't account for 15% of the driving population, but yet they account for 35% of the stop. So, you know, I've been waiting for this color blindness where you don't stop me because of my color. You know, I've been waiting to walk in the parking structure and see old white faculty like clutching the purse or watching the car, double checking their little old pinto. <laughs> you know, thinking that I might come back and rip off the pinto. I, I'm dead serious. You know, I, I, I'm waiting to see. A study came out the other day that talks about black Africans in America. Their education and success rate academically is higher than whites and Asian. And they significantly occupy jobs that pay much less in the society. I, I'm looking forward to, to this race neutral um, society where when we send out people with equal qualification, and if they have a name like Kwame Brown, you know, you don't call them for the interview. But if they name Mary Sue. They had a study about that. Yeah, no. Yeah, it consistently shows. So I will support the idea of this colorblind society when I see it coming. So I will use that argument. And, you know, I invite us now to, to talk about. I would probably say that one of the reasons why it's easier to open up to a colorblind society so far out of reach. So it's easier to be accepted to something that people know is so far out of reach. Mm -hmm. So, so the when comes in, like when do we do this sometime in the future? Yeah, yeah. So therefore, we don't have to talk about reparations. We talk about it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you. So, yes. And besides all that, and besides, yeah. Well, <laughs> being one of these people who are, who usually when I walk in the room, I'm probably the darkest, if not one of the darkest. <laughs> Most of the time I'm always, even when the students do these light the skin, dark skin, and I'm always in the, uh, they have this, they start with the lightest and they go the to the skin. Light. I'm always in the <laughs> skin. I'm in the spectrum. <laughs> but here's, the, here's some of the things that I, I run benefits in. It's kind of a, the, the good things and the evil things. When I'm on the phone, my name is Jerry Blake. And they hear Jerry Blake, they hear a white guy on the phone. <laughs> hey! Jerry Blake! Come to you! <laughs> they hear a white guy on the phone. When I'm talking about getting places, when I'm looking at places for rent or to buy or anything like that, I'm talking about products or even job markets and all that, they hear Jerry Blake and they see, this is what, this is what they see in their, in their minds. But when I get there, they see Jerry Blake. Wait a minute. 
you're African, you're, you're, you're dark. So, to me, I'm, I'm just, I'm really gonna have to take it back, the concept of color, colorblindness. I don't want you to start not seeing me, because when you start saying, I think it's an easy way out. And a lot of times when it's, uh, most of the people that have those viewpoints of, I don't see color, I don't want to see color, it's a colorblind society, it's an easy way out for them not to recognize, not to appreciate, not to accept who you are, what you have to be, and we tend to throw out words. I, don't, I want to throw out tolerance, I want to throw out acceptance, I want to throw out all these things that really are related to a lot of people of color. And the main thing for me is if you start saying colorblind society, it's usually the people that, that never have to go through it. It's always people that say, I, see, I don't see color or anything like that, and you don't go through it. And I have to tell them every time, but you're not the one that's going through it. I want you to see my color, but I want you to recognize it. So right. yeah. Respect is what you want, not like that in there. Privilege, privilege, privilege. breaking the law thing. What, uh, what okay. I'm curious no. about, though, is that reparations implies that something was done wrong, as you mm -hmm. said earlier. So there's an admittance of wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. you know, and there should be an admittance that's of wrongdoing. Right. Can you go back to Well, we, we have examples of reparations for slavery, too. When slavery was abolished in the Caribbean, in 1838, the white landowners were compensated for their economic loss. Um, they paid three million pounds. That's about five million US in 1838. That would be the equivalent of billions of dollars. So white landowners were compensated. Uh, so the, the precedence is there. Well, well, you know, whatever term we use, that the fact that after slavery abolished, they say, well, God, you people are going to lose some money. We need to pay you. Yeah, yeah. You lost your, you lost your, and you had 10 strong Negroes. We have to compensate you. They did. Let me, let me share some stuff um, that some people share that, so that probably sorry, should have heard. Oh, no, all over the Caribbean. So the government's paid for that? Yeah. No, it was the British government. The British government. You see, remember all these, um, like, most of the Caribbean islands that had slaves uh, were British colonies, including the, the, um, the U.S. initially, the, 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 the colony here. This was a colony in Britain. You don't remember, there was a war for independence. I mean, a lot of people kind of forget that the British used to own this place. <laughs> so, uh, but, but, you know, it, it is the reality that money was paid. What they decided to do in America was colorblind society said, Dr. Bigfoot, our world would no longer exist. I say that about black folks also, accounting for 12 point something percent of the population. If we went colorblind, uh, we'd cease to exist. There would be no value to our culture, to the things that we hold dear. Then this is what the African-American woman of um, the Neuropsychiatric Institute at UCLA had to say. Um, she quoted an African proverb, to know your future, you must understand your past. For America to open the doors to true social justice, she said, we must first understand the history and the treatment of minority groups. There's just no getting around the fact that you have to recognize, for example, when we talk about race consciousness, we recognize the differential treatment that people encounter. When we say, well, we're colorblind, you know, we, we don't see that, then when a black man talks about his experience on the street, like, you, how would you understand if you don't have that kind of experience? Nobody pulls you over just because you're black and driving a nice car. I guess my point here is that a colorblind society sounds wonderful. As a matter of fact, I have notions of this idealized proposal being realized in utopia. And I remember that as I sat under a coconut tree, no one called me shitless and lazy. As a matter of fact, none of the little old ladies plucked their purses as they passed me in utopia. I look forward to the day in the distant future when we'll be like that. But for the time being, I say, see my color, it's fine. The treatment for opponents is that one, um, blacks own slaves, Two, blacks were complicit in the slave trade. Um, three, like we're so far removed, it wouldn't interfere anyhow. And the list goes on and on and on and on. Preparations. Dr. Martin Luther King um, on America signify its people if they deprive them. And you know, he's saying after 300 years, uh, people are certainly deserving 
of being paid reparations. Um, Jordan Anderson is a former slave who wrote a letter I shared with some of you guys last time. I don't have time to read the letter now, but the idea of paying reparations has been around since the end of slavery. Um, we have John Conyers. He's one of the biggest supporters. He introduced um, the bill, the Africa Reparation Movement called ARM. They're out of Britain. Um, maybe they are the strongest group um, like in the entire world on the in the reparation movement. And, of course, Randall Robbins, in his seminal book, The Dead, What America Owes, is like good reading for discussion on the subject. Ron Walters, um, a professor, I think he, George Washington, uh, university, he's a political scientist. Charles Ogletree is a law professor at Harvard, um, and he has done like, a lot of good work in this area, black for reparations in America. I have a handout with a list of sites um, and addresses of entities that support reparation that um, you guys might want to check. Let me quickly mention some of the legal basis for reparation. Some argument coming out of the Organization of African Unity. And this is what they say. Um, capital transfer, that is the actual exchange of money. It says the enslavement of Africans was a crime against humanity. International law recognizes that those who commit crimes against humanity, humanity must pay reparations. There is no legal barrier to prevent those who still suffer the consequences of crime against humanity from claiming reparations, even though the crimes were committed against their ancestors. The claim would be brought on behalf of all Africans in Africa and in the diaspora who suffer the consequences of crime through the agency of an appropriate representative body. And that body could be the United Nations. The claim would be brought against the government of those countries which promoted and were enriched by the African slave trade and the institution of slavery, which would include the United States, um, Europe, England, France, Holland, Spanish, Spain, and Portugal as a country I'm trying to remember. The amount of the claim would be assessed by experts in each aspect of, of life and in each region affected by the institution of slavery. The claim if not settled by agreement would be ultimately would ultimately be determined by a special international tribunal recognized by all parties. So this is a seven point legal claim as put forward by um, the African Reparation Movement. Ogle Tree, uh, um, one of the attorneys that have filed a lawsuit, um, has put forward some argument and then there is this is a former law student um, that she has filed on behalf of, who discovered evidence linking U.S. cooperation to slave trade. Uh, she filed a lawsuit to seek billions of dollars for reparation for the descendants of slaves. And the lawsuit was filed in Brooklyn, and they've named Aetna and 100 additional corporations um, at a later date to be sued. Now, I mentioned California listing companies that insured slaves as property. They, they'll use this information as part of their legal um, approach to get a reparation. We have, let me share what I believe about reparation and how we should approach them. As I said at the beginning, first of all, I believe that any, any conversation about reparation should be wider than just reparation for African Americans in America. Um, any conversation, I believe, must include Africa um, and the Caribbean and wherever blacks and descendants of slaves are found, where slavery was practiced and where people are still encountering the deleterious effects of slavery and post-slavery treatment. Um, so that's the first thing I believe that we should start with, um, with a conversation to include um, like a larger group of people. I believe that we should explore setting up funds for low or no interest or um, um, I believe in putting billions of dollars in education to include professional, academic, vocational, technical and arts training. Um, I believe in, and this one is critical, this idea is not original with me, it comes out of the Organization of African Unity, suggesting that Africa 
parts of Africa, countries in Africa should be given seats on important UN bodies, such as the Security Council. So I think that this has to be part of the discussion where people who represent black people have <coughs> positions that are important where they have clout and can influence policies, um, especially in the United Nations. I think seats are important seats in institutions like the World Bank um, is also critical. Uh, I believe, finally, that we should contemplate debt relief for third developing countries, um, especially countries um, with black population that have been the victim of slavery. The, the discussion of reparations can be about what am I going to get out of this. It has to be how do we embrace things that benefit the wider community. Um, and this is one of the reasons why I haven't reached a position yet where I support paying dollars and cents to any particular individual. I say have the money in a place where masses of people can benefit, not just individuals. Because, you know, invariably those who are more savvy are going to get more and find ways to leave the less savvy ones behind. You know, it happens every time we say, let's support some people. You know, people who don't have any voice, who don't have any power, get left behind. And those who are sharp and have connection and know people in politics, get it. And, you know, they, you see them being contractors and having businesses that set it up. So those are my thoughts. A formal apology from the government with the president making the apology on behalf of the people. I mean, I think it, no matter how much money they give, if there is an apology and admitting that wrong was done, you know, like we still wouldn't have got there. So I think that may be one of the most critical things, that we must have that formal apology. You know what? Like, we have that apology, maybe we can start moving on. Because it is an admittance that, you know what, I did wrong. I think for me, uh, that I agree with that. <coughs> Even but the way I grew up too, though, is that we get apologies all, apologies all the time. So for me, I, I'm not really looking for an apology because a lot of people know it anyway, and they still don't apologize, and, and they know what happened and what, what, what occurred. I guess one question for what are you going to do after that? What are you going to do? You know, I don't need the money, but what are you going to continue to do? Um, in other words, I don't want the empty words. I don't want the uh, the hypocritical statements of, uh, like you mentioned earlier, like a, a Bill Clinton type of person or whatever. I want to see some actual progress in changing or fixing mm -hmm. what you talked about earlier. So be it reparations, be it uh, an apology followed by a line, uh, a line list of suggestions, mm -hmm. line list of suggestions on how we're going to try to solve this. But if you don't add that with the apology for me, and for a lot of people, and if you go around and talk to a lot of people who have started hearing about reparations or not, and people that don't know anything about it, the first thing they say is, I want them to apologize to me. I want them to, what they're going to do after that. Right. And this, uh, maybe this is why I'm saying, because ultimately, let me tell you something. The best person to look out for me is me. Right. So ultimately, we have to talk about personal responsibility. So if we have the institutions, we have the resources, then it's up to us individually to access those and make something up for, for ourselves. And this is why I'm saying, you know, individually, could give me stuff. Right. And I can go do whatever I want to do with it, you know, or, or like invest and, and get rich. But let's have the opportunity there, you know, the low interest loan or the no interest loan. Let's have it. Not everybody is set out to be uh, like academic, but you know, it's vocational training, it's art training, whatever it is. Let's have that opportunity. And we know it's there. I mean, a lot of kids want to come right here to Sac State today and they can't afford it. Here, send a test to get in. And they can't afford to go to school because you know they have to work to take care of the family or whatever. So I'm saying the, the, the vestiges are there and we just provide opportunity. Because ultimately we have to take care of ourselves. You know, I don't want nobody doing it for me. But give me the opportunity. And when we start making use of those opportunities, then maybe we can even start having a discussion about the colorblindness. Yeah, you know, we can we can get romantic, you know, and talk about the colorblindness, but give me some opportunities. Because you know what? In spite of racism and prejudice, if you have the resources and the opportunities to compete, at least you stand a chance. But if you don't have that dog, eat your supper. Yeah. So far, you know something though. Ultimately, 
we still have to be the one to tell people what we're doing. Right. I mean, in all honesty, right. but I'm saying, you know, if we have the creativity, if right. we know how to create good posters so that we attract people when they read our posters, right. then they'll come to our events. Right. You know, if we have, the, if we learn how to present and how to speak well, so when people hear that we're speaking, they come to hear us. So I think ultimately we have to take responsibility for making people know what it is we have. But I'm just saying, give us the opportunity to do that. So I think it, I think it, I think what I'm trying to say is, it's a little bit of both. We need the opportunity, we need the recognition of what it is. But in order to have the opportunities that we give these listings of opportunities, in order to give the listing of our accomplishments, we still got to have the acknowledgement. Meaning that, okay, we do have this from somebody, we acknowledge it, now we'll, we'll put it out there for them. So, See, you know. I'm just thinking of a, a small child in a school, a, a predominantly white school. That particular small child may not ever, in the midst of all those, of all those white students, that one African American child may not ever be able to know that her classmate recognized what happened to her race of people because they may not ever be told to this until they get to be an adult. But then there's so many set generations, so many set moments. So I'm saying that apology beyond that, those two people recognize it and accept it yeah. and acknowledge it. But you see, from but, but, birth on, and that means we looking at a whole society. It may be impossible, but it may be But look at this, though. I I hear what you guys say about the apology, but think about this. Like an apology, and I'm not talking about like some boomer thing where you know, like you're dressing up something. An apology <laughs> suggests that you admit to a wrong and you're sorry about it. I mean, so like that's a place to start, you know. Okay, so like we've done that, Let, let's move on. But if you never admit to wrongdoing, I mean, it's hard to have a conversation. Let's have to be some let's have to be like Well, I appreciate the discussion, I'm sorry, I can't wait. Really um, but one of the things I, I think it needs to be very important is it's not the idea of reparations. It's really trying to make it a more level playing field from an economic standpoint. We live in a very competitive culture. Capitalism by its nature is competitive. That's why the dollars are symbolic, but they're more than that. If we could possibly do what you're talking about is set up some trusts and some funds and some areas that, where there is true, truly an attempt to, to um, have a more level playing field, and a, a situation where people who come from uh, disadvantaged economic, racial backgrounds can say, now I truly believe in, in the system in which I was born into, that I have these opportunities. Mm -hmm. I can do it. I don't have to in, in, overcome all those insurmountable odds in order to even be heard or, or, or come to a university. And that, that there are ways to sort of propel this. And I think that, the, that, that, that mission is very different than the discussions I've heard about reparations, which is just giving individuals money. That's right, a different thing. Well, let me take issue with one piece of what you say here, Dave. When you say, like, if you come from a disadvantaged background, you see, it doesn't have to be means tested. We're not talking about helping all poor people. Mm -hmm. Because, like, all black people in this diaspora and in Africa have been affected by slavery, even if they have money like Michael Jordan. Because, you know, it was set up. This institution, Michael Jordan might never access it, you know, because he doesn't need to. But at least it should be there, and if he wanted to, he should. So it's not just about the poor. Because I'm saying all of us, in the way how we see ourselves, you know, has been directly influenced by slavery and post-slavery events. I mean, even if we're walking around like peacocks, as proud as they come, then the way how we see the world, has still been significantly influenced by the history and experiences that our poor beers have had. You know, like look, we have it kind of easy you now, but like your parents, you know, if, you, if your parents are from the South, they didn't. You know, they had to get them in the back of the bus. You know, like they go to the, the top part of the theater because downstairs are for white people. So even if you have a lot of money now, they're still praying by that. And the way how they taught you and raise you strongly influenced. So I'm just saying it, it, it is to be open to all. It's not means tested. It's not for the poor or the dispossessed, for the drunk or whoever. It is for any black person at home or abroad who want to make use of that opportunity. At least that's my position. You know, so, John. You know,
but so yes, so can I just that. can I just make this point though? Like you guys are talking about the mechanics of how we do it. Right. You know, and I mean I'm not saying no. Because when we say I mean remember we're talking about at a government level now. You know, we're the government of the United States. So like you have a whole prepared statement and you know like it, it will outline and you can have then all kind of committees maybe like working to disseminate certain kind of information. I mean those kind of nitty gritty details. So I'm just saying an apology. An apology for what? Admitting wrongdoing. And if you admit wrongdoing, like what is the wrong that was done, you know? It was like whatever. The Jim Crow laws and the sanctioning of, of slavery and you know the treatment, whatever it is. So you could write a whole book outlining what it is that's being apologized for. So I'm not just saying like some hypocrite president go up and read off a script, you know, and say like we apologize and no question and you know he's gone back into his room. I'm not talking about something, I'm talking about a real document. We're the United Nation and you know so we have it and it's, it's in the Library of Congress and you know it's sent out to the schools and we all have it as evidence. And so when we're teaching, when we're doing Black History Month, we teach in a class, you know, you say it was in 2005. You know, just like when we read something on the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's a document kind of, but it's more than that than a document where you have that. And the discussion continues. I really think that um, until we write that wrong, we're not going to move on this. You know, we're not going to move on this issue. And go back to what I said at the beginning. If you go discuss this, pro or con, you really have to know the facts. You have to be articulate. You know, like you have to really be convincing because, you know, otherwise people might think you're just out to get money or you're just a racist, like against people getting money. And you can't have discussion like when people just take it at that kind of base level. I mean, I thank you guys for overseeing your time. You know? <laughs> Enjoy the discussion and I'm glad you were able to come and participate. Hey, thank you for your insight, man. And, you know, as I say, you know, I'm constantly looking for ideas as to like how we make sense out of this.